Nasnari describes the meeting place of the kings, and that's where we'll start our tour, at the Moat of Nais, which is in fact the oldest man-made structure in the town. The Doon, or fort, dates from the early Celtic period and was the seat of the kings of Leinster for over 700 years. It actually rivaled the Hill of Tara in its importance and significance as a meeting place. The last king to reside here was Carew, and he died in the year 904. The town was visited by St. Patrick on several occasions, notably in the year 448. The moat is also associated with the coming of the Anglo-Normans in the 1100s. They used the mound on which they constructed a mutton bailey. This is a defensive structure consisting of a hill with a keep on top and surrounded below by a fenced off area known as a bailey. And this would have been a typical building associated with the Anglo-Normans. The moat is an integral part of both the town's ancient and medieval heritage. So walking back uh, down Abbey Road towards the canal, we come to the Abbey Graveyard. The Abbey Graveyard is on the site of a former Dominican Abbey dating back to 1335 and was built by the Anglo-Norman Fisustus family. The ruins of the Abbey were still here in the 1700s and the story goes that the stones from the ruins were actually used to build the Abbey Bridge over the canal in 1789. So we'll head back towards the moat again and as we pass the, the Moat Theatre, we see the building there, which is at the top of Moat Lane. The Moat building was the original residence of the Christian brothers when they came to Nice in 1871. So we now walk down Moat Lane, and this takes us down into South Main Street, the Market Square, which is really the centre of Nice. This is a good point to consider the advent of the Anglo-Normans coming to Nice. Strongbow, who led the Anglo-Normans, and he was called Richard de Clare, he granted the barony of Nice in 1170 to Morris Fitzmorris. This resulted in the Normans fortifying the town with walls, including a number of gates, in fact six in total, and also castles, or more accurately fortified houses, of which there were nine in total around the walls. And remember, these Normans came from the Pembrokeshire area in Wales. Now, unfortunately, there is very little left to remind us of these fortifications, except for St. David's Castle, also known as King John's Castle. This is a very important building. That's what makes it unique. This is in Church Lane, just off South Main Street. Built around 1206, it was visited on two occasions by King John himself in 1206, and 1210. Parliament was actually held there during the King's visit in 1210. It remained a normal stronghold in the 13th and 14th centuries, and an interesting little story is that there's an underground tunnel leading from the castle in the direction of the moat, which probably suggests a connection between these two fortifications. Just beside the castle, we enter the vicinity of St. David's Church from the top of North Main Street. The church is on the site of an earlier Celtic church, most likely dedicated to St. Corbin, a local saint, or St. Patrick. There are some parts of the original Norman church incorporated in the present building. The first reference to the church is in 1212, and it is named after the patron saint of Wales, St. David. The church is still used today by the local Church of Ireland congregation. As we walk back into North Main Street, we passed the Presbyterian Church on the left-hand side, a fine stone building that was built between 1866 and 1868, the foundation stone being laid by John the Touche. So now just across from the church stands a town hall, and this is a unique building. Built in 1792, originally as a jail, the building has a checkered history. It is actually built on the site of White Castle, which was one of the medieval castles built by the Normans when fortifying the town. It was the scene of a fierce battle in the 1798 rebellion between the Crown forces, in fact the Armagh militia, stationed in the building, and rebels led by local farmer Michael Reynolds, who hailed from the Tipper area. The rebels were heavily defeated and subjected afterwards to some extreme brutality by the Crown forces. 
The building later became the centre of local government for over 150 years and was a meeting place for NACE UDC for many years. We will walk further along South Main Street now and then turn right down Mason Street. And this takes us to the Canal Harbour. The Nace Canal is a branch line coming off the Grand Canal at Soldiers Island near Salins. It has five sets of locks and two fine old stone bridges, namely Abbey Bridge and Tandy's Bridge. Finished in 1789, the Canal Stores building in the harbour still stands proud after some restoration in the 1980s and was once a hive of commercial activity. It's interesting to note that the last commercial barge left Nace Harbour in 1960. Just across from the Canal Stores is the Market House, built in 1813 by the Earl of Mayo of Palmerstown House. It was very much associated with canal trading and handling produce delivered by the barges on their journeys to and from the, the town. If we now exit Basin Street and turn right, a little further along North Main Street we find the courthouse. Built in 1807, it's an impressive stone building boasting some fine pillars in front. These pillars were added in 1859. It is noted for its fine Victorian courtrooms, so much so that it has been used in several well-known films. Also, one courtroom has a great similarity to a courtroom in Bow Street Magistrate Court in London. Next door to the courthouse is the old Garda Barracks, and again, uh, an interesting building. Originally an RIC barracks built in 1870, it still retains its turrets and loopholes and is architecturally a fine building built in semi baronical style. The local story is that in the days of the British rule, it was originally meant for somewhere in the empire, namely India, but the plans got mixed up and so we have it in this. On the neighbouring Linster later building, there are two interesting plaques commemorating former editors of the newspaper, Seamus O'Kelly, poet, dramatist, journalist, nationalist, and John Wise Power, who was a founder member of the GAA in 1884. Incidentally, Seamus O'Kelly lived in the cottage at the first lock on the canal and was known as the Gentle Revolutionary. We now head up towards Murder's Corner and turn right uh, onto the Newbridge Road. Our destination here is a large ruined building on the outskirts of the town. However, along the Newbridge Road, we pass the new Irish Kildara building, the glass building, I'm sure, which everyone knows. It is on the site of the old military barracks built by the British in 1813 and later named Devoy Barracks after the Fenian leader John Devoy who was born, actually, just outside Nace at Green Hills. The old arch and clock tower of the barracks still remain. The barracks was well known being the home of the Dublin Fusiliers for many years. A little bit further along the Newbridge Road, there are the remains of a castle, Castle Rag. This is a pale castle built in the 1400s. Nace was on the periphery of the pale, which had many fortified houses along its defensive line and included in this defensive line would have been Clongo's Wood Castle. A little bit further along, we come to our destination, which is the ruins of Jiggenstown House, arguably the largest brick house ever built in Ireland, and one of the largest in Britain. It was built around 1639 by Thomas Wentworth, Earl of Stratford, and the Lord Lieutenant of Ireland. It was meant to be a residence for the King of England, King Charles, on a visit, However, it was never completed. Wentworth, once one of the king's favourites, fell out of favour, was recalled to London, tried for treason and executed in 1641. Now, there's a little anecdote here which is interesting. The story is told that the red bricks used to build the house were shipped by sea originally from Wales to Dublin. They were then transported hand to hand to Nace by a line of people handing bricks to one another down the line. So now, folks, we'll head over to the opposite side of the town and on to the Salmons Road. The site of the Roman Catholic Church of Our Lady and St. David on the Salmons Road was acquired in the early 1800s as a free gift from the de Burgh Estate and was opened in 1827. 
a fine steeple was added between 1851 and 1858. If we travel a little further down the uh, Sands Road, we'll come to the gates of the De Burg estate at Old Town. De Burgs were a very prominent and famous and well-known family in Ireland. William de Burg came to Ireland with the Anglo-Normans in 1172 and was granted extensive lands in Limerick. Thomas de Burg, born in 1670, bought land around Nace in the 1690s and Old Town was built in 1695, forming part of a large estate. Thomas de Burg was an eminent architect. He is noted for buildings like the Library and Trinity College and the Royal Hospital at Kilmainham. The family became an integral part of the fabric of Nace and resided in Old Town until the death of Major de Burg and his wife Claire, not too many years ago. There is a holy well in the Elder Grove in the Old Town estate and is dedicated to St. Patrick. And this is where it is reputed the saint baptised King Dooling's children. To reach our final destination, we travel along the Dublin Road to the Nace Ball. Now, although neither an ancient or medieval structure, it is in fact modern, it is however synonymous with Nace and recognised throughout the land, as it does take us up to the present time and into the 21st century. We finish our journey as that from the Nace Moat in Celtic times to the Nace Ball in the 21st century. 